Ladies and gentlemen, with no much further ado, J.J. Winder. Clap for the man, thank you! Uh, lovely clap, thank you. That might be the only I get today, so thanks again for that. First, thank you for all of our sponsors, those that put this on, the vault, it's everybody that made this happen. Uh, very thankful to be here in person, seeing all the faces, and one of the reasons why I signed up to do a talk is so I could... Uh, rock 20 minutes without a mask on, so uh, very thankful for that. Today, you know, the, the spot of this talk actually came from Dallas. I don't know if Dallas is in here. He said he was going to listen to it, but uh, he actually turned me on to this book. Uh, it was a couple of years ago. I hadn't read it, right? The Cuckoo's Egg. It was written back in 1990. I think it was when it was published. It was probably written a little bit before that time, but Great book, great story, kind of started the process of me thinking, and I took notes why I read the book, because there's so many applicable lessons that are still valuable today that I'm hoping to share with you. There's nothing going to be too insightful with this talk, uh, more just reflections on reading the book. By a show of hands, who's actually read The Cuckoo's Egg? All right, that's a lot less than I expected. So if you have not... I, there, there's a couple. There's a couple spoilers, but not too many. There's, nah, it's not really a spoiler. You could read probably the back of the book and get just as much information. So, again, the cuckoo's egg, and I'm going to tie it back to Groundhog Day because the the repetitive nature of what we do in 30 years, and there's still applicable stuff. So, my name is JJ Widener. I'm the director of information security for a small healthcare IT organization. They're based out of Maryland. I work remotely here in Kansas City. So very thankful to be here. Have a whole alphabet soup of uh, certs that I've earned and I uh, got pretty good at taking tests. So I like learning. I love learning the context of information security and, and how it applies to, to help out our organizations. So this is Cliff Stahl. Goes by Cliff. I think they call him Dr. Stahl as well. I love this quote that he has. Data is not information. Information is not knowledge. Knowledge is not understanding. Understanding is not wisdom. So valuable lessons still today, again, that I mentioned earlier from his book. It was written some time ago, back in the age of uh, digital, uh, digital equipment corporation, so DECs and uh, OpenVMS. Has anybody in here actually used OpenVMS? All right, got a couple. So yeah, it's, uh, so it's, been, a, it's been a while. Um, I haven't, I've used OpenVMS in one, one context, but not much. So it's been a few years. Groundhog Day, the movie. So this movie came out, you know, 93. Comedy classic, if you haven't watched it, you know, I don't know if you want to or not, but pretty funny Bill Murray movie. But the, the part of the movie is that he repeats the same day over and over and over. And there'll be a little trivia question at the end is how many days was Bill Murray actually in Groundhog Day? Doing the same thing over and over. So it reminds me, at least it reminded me, reading this book, because in the book, you'll hear Cliff talk about running to do a phone trace. So he'd actually have to wake up, run to his campus, start a phone trace to start tracking this adversary, start tracking the attacker. So, uh, you know, and sometimes we need comedy in cybersecurity, right? Because as we saw from one of the previous talks, it is one of the most stressful professions. It can be a very stressful profession when you talk about dealing with attackers, you're dealing with the change in technology, you're dealing with, you know, the rapid amount of vulnerabilities that we have to deal with on a daily basis and trying to help protect our environment. So, uh, so we need some comedy because we have to do a lot of things over and over. Anybody here work in compliance? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so, you know, talking about over and over, there's a lot of things that we have to do over and over is that yearly audit. So I digress, better get moving. We've got some lessons in this book. So again, the, the, the start of the book is a 75 cent accounting discrepancy is how this adversary was discovered. Cliff was looking through the, the notes. He was looking through the accounting of who's paying for access to TimNet, T-Y-M-N-E-N-T. -E it's uh, back in the day, that's how they, the, you know, the internet, you paid for 10 net access and you had to pay to be on that network, uh, paid quite a bit of money. So a 75 cent accounting discrepancy is how this journey started. Multiple years of tracking down an adversary, an international adversary that ended up being over there in Germany. So he was one guy, an astronomer, not an IT person by trade, that took it upon himself with his curiosity, with wanting to try to figure it out and track down in one of the first documented cases of cyber espionage that we have, 
and wrote it all in a great book. So it, it, it's an awesome story. Uh, so if you haven't read it, not many uh, spoilers here, but it, you know, and there was lax security. So you get a, a computer on the network, it could talk and manipulate files and you know, move files, copy files from anywhere if you're all connected to this network. They had some basic security measures, but, but not many. So again, the callback to Groundhog Day, when he had to run and run those traces over and over and over again. So there's a big chunk of the book. That's what it actually talks about. So it, it, again, whenever I read it, I was thinking, oh my goodness, this is, this is what we do sometimes on a day in, day out basis. We go through the same motions. You know, so trying to keep it creative, being curious, finding a better way is always a challenge that I have for myself. So lesson number one, it's more of a quote actually. It doesn't take brilliance or wizardry to break into a computer, just patience, right? So I think it was from the first keynote of, uh, maybe it was one of the other keynotes, sorry, where you, you identify a vulnerability, I'm just gonna uh, pack that away, I'm gonna hold on to that. Now I know that you have that vulnerability, I'm just gonna wait, and I'm gonna keep scanning your environment to see if you know, you're not patching correctly. So, you know, that patience, and then kick off that, that exploit uh, later. So. Again, patience, those advanced, persistent threats, those APTs, uh, those nation state actors, they're really working uh, to be persistent. They're working on their patience level, hoping that you make a mistake. Lesson number two, so it's non-technical resources can actually be highly valuable. That, that their way of thinking, because uh, sometimes we get in a siloed view, right? We, we know what we know. You know, we don't know what we don't know. That's what I loved about Dave Hull's talk uh, previously. You know, it's right. We don't know what we don't know. So sometimes uh, getting somebody from the outside looking in can actually help us kind of jar us out of the way we always think of things. So he, he was able to systematically figure out where this attacker was coming from, deduce logic, logging down everything, uh, multiple printouts, so he, he's an astronomer by trade, and he loves making Klein bottles, so he just looks really excited. So a Klein bottle is almost, a, it's a bottle inside of itself, uh, so it actually hooks into itself, so kind of fun. He loves making, I think Dallas has a signed one from Cliff Stahl, so you can, you can talk to him about that. So again, pulling on those resources that might not be in IT or information security, there might not be on the red team or blue team, you know, getting their input, getting their insights could be very valuable to help us get out of our uh, kind of siloed way of thinking. Lesson number three. Again, these are my lessons that I pulled out of the book. They might not be lessons to you, but something that, that I, I took away. So document everything, right? Keep a log. I have my, my OneNote. Every time I, I get something new, every time I learn something new, I jot it down in my OneNote. You know, so I can easily search through it. I couldn't imagine trying to write that down or remember where I wrote it down to try to flip through it or have a stack of printouts this large that I highlighted and have to flip through those. So thankfully we have much better tools to kind of help consolidate our notes nowadays. But he, he spent a good deal of time documenting everything. So you have to, and he was meticulous. That's how they were able to track down the adversary and, and eventually uh, get that conviction. So lesson number four, correlate data for new trends. So he had to pull data sources. Again, I already mentioned the, you know, the printouts. You know, so he actually, and I think I have a slide in this uh, later on, but some deceptive techniques, you know, that he had to correlate data for new trends. He had to pull data sources up, printed pieces of paper, and keep track of where all these were. You know, I, I could just imagine what it looked like trying to track down whenever you don't have some of the systems we do now and how to find you know, all these different elements where you might not have the right timestamp. You know, you might just be working on a username to access the system. So, you know, now we have sims, you know, they're flashy, you know, which is great, but if they're not configured correctly or you're not pulling in the, the, the correct data, you know, they could just be that flashy light of technology that sits up on your shelf that nobody really touches. You know, you set it up to send you notifications uh, then the notifications get too noisy, so I'm just gonna, you know, shuffle those uh, notifications somewhere in my inbox. You know, I'll take a look at them sometime. So again, finding that valuable information, uh, understanding what we're looking at, correlating that data, is something I took away as well. So being patient and persistent. 
yeah, again, we have to be patient sometimes, but sometimes it goes back to that, uh, you know, recalling Dave Hall's uh, talk, you know, of that, that, that instant thinking that 95% of the time we're making those, those system one decisions, right? Uh, where, where it's telling system two what to do. But we have to be patient at times. We have to think of new ways. And you have to be presenting, you have to be patient when you're presenting to your organization. Has anybody tried to present a new budget line item when it's outside of the budget season? For any of those that, you know, it can be very difficult, right? Unless it's an emergency or something major happened, you want to procure some new funding to purchase this new tool, but you miss the window by two months and now you gotta put it on next year's cycle. So again, being persistent, having that line of communication open, you know, someone might eventually listen and, and hopefully something bad doesn't happen to where, you know, the, the pocketbooks come open, but that leads me to like, don't waste a good crisis either. If something like that does happen, you probably need to buy something. So valuable lesson number six, and this you know, goes to those, those newcomers to our profession. You know, if you have a passion, if you're interested, if you have a natural curiosity, there's no way we can know everything. Not even close. You know, I can take as many cert tests, I can you know, read all day long. There's just every new rabbit hole leads to another new rabbit hole. That's why I'm thankful for conferences like this where we can get the collective together and I can learn something new. There has been one time I went to a conference where I've known everything, nor will there be, because I, I don't know everything. So if you're, if you're passionate though, and passions can be short-lived, but if you have a, a love for it or a, curi a natural curious nature, it goes a long way in this profession. And Cliff, he didn't have a passion for this. He, he didn't have a passion you know, just for cybersecurity. You know, he had a, a, a curiosity on why is this person accessing our system? What is this 75 cent account discrepancy? I gotta figure out what it is. And then, then he traversed, you know, and the attacker was, was trying to get like military documents. The, you know, he was in Miners Network, you know, in McLean, Virginia. So, you know, he was in the FBI systems. He was in the NSA systems, you know. So uh, this attacker was, was all over the place and Cliff had to really, uh, educate them, and there's a slide on that uh, as well later, but uh, you have to always be curious in our profession uh, to keep going. Again, budget is another thing because I, I, I deal with it on a, on a daily basis sometimes. I, I would like to get this thing, uh, but you know, sometimes you have to find another way. You know, write a script, build your own thing, uh, take the time to learn a new way of doing it. And you know, you might not have the budget now, you might get the budget later, but we can always be doing something, right? Rather than you know doing nothing. And sometimes you do nothing and you get a promotion, but that's not the real world, you know. So all right, valuable lesson number eight. Honey pots can help. Make sure they're configured correctly. Has anybody here had a honey pot that was configured to actually give them uh, actionable intelligence? A couple, yeah. It can be difficult, right? So you can configure in that way. Hopefully the actionable intelligence you are receiving can be you know, something you can take that information and it's not just information that the attacker is feeding you, right? If they know it's a honeypot, if it hasn't been discovered, you know, but, but honeypots, you know, Cliff was one of the first that ever documented the deceptive techniques of using a honeypot. They can be very effective. You can place a file that if it's open, it'll send you an email. Or you can, you know, I think somebody was talking about it early today where, where there's a MS SQL uh, or a MySQL uh, token where you can, you know, somebody's trying to feed you some SQL injection commands in MySQL, it'll send you a notification. So I learned something new and I think that was just released. So I was taking a note on that. How can we use that? So, uh, but honeypots can be very effective and Cliff was one of the first ones to document it. I, I didn't use a meme on this one because this one is, uh, I think very important. We are more than just cables and wires, right? So networks, what we're trying to protect, our organizations, you know, this community here is much more than just ones and zeros. You know, it's a collaborative effort. And I, I, I really thought it was interesting on Cliff's explanation of a cyber criminal, they're vandals, right? So we distrust and paranoia. So how can we come together to help uh, combat that paranoia, combat uh, that distrust and work together? So publicizing new attacks, so he, he found a vulnerability, it was in a new EMAC, it was like a, a text editing software back in the day, right? So you actually had a GUI interface to interact with your text and 
uh, all these universities wanted it. It was a vulnerability in that system that led uh, that attacker to be able to traverse through the network and, and kind of perform that lateral movement between systems. And he, he let the people know that needed to know. But rather than going out and you know putting it on GitHub, here's how you exploit you know new Emacs or you know here's how you exploit this one thing or the other. So it can be a two-edged sword. So making sure we're, we're reporting responsibly, uh, you know, informing, uh, making sure that we're doing the the correct type of knowledge sharing and not publicizing out vulnerabilities is something I took away as well. So 75 cents is how it started, and it's hard to quantify damages. Whenever you can't go to your organization and say, hey, we just lost 75 cents, how many of you think you're gonna get a new budget spend on that, right? So having and knowing what kind of data, and sometimes the data that you don't have, can be very helpful. So always seeking out uh, new ways. So was it really the data that was the issue? What about everybody that spends their time fixing the issues? Or you know, let's say it was a, a, a nasty exploit that, that hosed your whole environment, you know, so the attacker actually did malicious damage, they didn't steal any data, but now it's the resource time to rebuild, it's the resource time to procure new uh, new technology or new software to, to combat this threat. So understanding your systems, what we're trying to protect, and sometimes it's not just the data they're trying to steal, they just want to wreak havoc too, but uh, I found that to be interesting that this all started because he discovered that 75 cent discrepancy. And lastly, which I think is one of the most important pieces of the book that I really took away, is knowledge sharing is critical. Coming to conferences, uh, being a part of, of groups like ISC Squared, ISACA, the IAPP for privacy professionals, the H uh, ISAC, so there's a health ISAC or an H ISAC, there's FIN ISAC, there's REN ISAC for higher education. So there's a lot of information sharing communities that share openly about threats, new vulnerabilities in their environments, how can we work on that? So being a part of that is helpful to the community, right? It, it helps overall, it helps spread that knowledge. So I highly encourage everyone to be a part of those if you're not. I mean, even coming to this conference is, is doing some type of knowledge sharing, right? You're talking to others, you're, you're gaining knowledge hopefully from me, but you know, from a lot of the talks that I listen to today, I'm always bringing away something. So uh, share the knowledge as well. If you get an opportunity to write a proposal or do a talk, you know, don't automatically think you're not gonna be good at it. Uh, go out there and try, and you'll be amazed. Uh, oh yeah, and I thought this was it. So he spent many hours trying to convince the FBI, CIA, NSA, that there was this, this person that's in their systems some of them shut off access immediately. Some of them say, uh, you know, there's nothing really happening here or didn't believe them. So he documented again everything. He was able, able to show them like the trail log of everything that was happening. So it really brought a lot of light onto this new cyber espionage uh, movement that was, that was getting ready to happen and was happening at that point in time. So again, Cliff Stahl was one of the pioneers of discovering and kind of tracking the deceptive, the blue team, and he put it all in a nice book that's actually a really good story as well. So I, if you haven't read it, highly encouraged. So the cuckoo, so why is the, the book named Cuckoo's Egg? So this is a cuckoo bird being fed by a robin. So as you can see, the cuckoo is three times the size, maybe even more than that than the robin. So cuckoo birds lay their eggs in other birds' nests playing off the ignorance of that species to raise that bird as their own, or that, that chickling or whatever bird is their own. So I take away with this, don't let others play off our ignorance of our systems and have them lay cuckoo eggs in our networks or in our environments. You know, take away some of the lessons, hopefully from here, and, and you know, all the learning that you have to help prevent that type of activity. I thought that was a pretty funny picture. All right, random trivia, as I think I'm coming up on time for our next speaker. So how many days has Bill Murray been stuck in Groundhog Day? Anybody want to take a stab? Did you uh, Google it? 30 years. Oh, uh, I like it. Let's say, wasn't it somewhere around like, it was mid to, it was like mid 30, it was like 34. Or yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's close. 38. 38? Yeah, so the internet doesn't know there's debate, but it is around that 33, 34, 
year mark. Uh, some say it has to be more than 10 years because he learned to play the piano like a grand meister, right? A grand pianist. So, uh, so it had to be more than 10 years. But he, you know, you spend 10 years doing something. So if you're again, you're coming in uh, to the profession, or you're you're still learning in this, you know, there's no way I know it all. There's no way anybody in this room will know it all. We are better together, right? We learn from each other, but we can help each other. So I, I take that as an encouragement to others to, to work with each other and, you know, cut yourself some slack if you've been doing it less than 10 years. You know, after 10 years, you should know everything, right? Uh, uh, yeah, never will. Um, and there's Bill Murray eating a baby Ruth, if anybody knows what movies that's from. So, and thank you. That is my quick and succinct talk. I appreciate your attention and interaction. Thank you. And uh, please uh, take a look at that QR code and provide some feedback if you want to. I appreciate it as well. Thank you so much. One more round of applause.